You are tuned into the Power Court Hour right here on 107.9 WRFA, as well as on Power Court Hour podcast or watching on YouTube. However you are checking this out, thank you for checking it out. I'm your host, Anthony Merchant. We have a returning guest. We had Mr. Luke Bentham of the Dirty Nil. We talked to him a couple of years ago. God, yeah, a couple of years ago when uh, Fuck Art came out. And uh, now he's back. We got a new uh, Dirty Nil record, Free Reign to Passions. It is out now everywhere. It's been out a couple months. But uh, if you've not checked it out, I don't know what you're doing. Time to check it out. So we're going to talk some uh, new music and more with Luke. Luke, how you doing, man? I'm great. I'm great. Uh, it's a beautiful sunny day here in uh, Hamilton, Ontario. And uh, yeah, happy to be on the Power Court Hour. Thank you very much for having me again. So I know, uh, I, bet, I guess it's been a couple weeks now since you've uh, been back. But I know you guys just did a UK run. How did uh, how'd that run of uh, shows go for you? Oh, it was it was excellent. I mean, we haven't we haven't uh, we haven't been over there since 2019, and we haven't headlined there since like 2018 or like 16, wow. like a real tour over there, like of us headlining. So it was great to see the. I mean, I, I think we're just very uh, humbled and fortunate by how many. Uh, by how much bigger the shows are now and how uh how many people are coming out and how everyone how many people know all the words and just the overall kind of vibe of the shows is uh <clears throat> so much more uh so much more incredible than it it has been in the past i mean pre pandemic i'd say i mean we've always had good shows in london but outside of there, it's kind of been hit and miss, and there wasn't one kind of. They were all they were all just raging shows of people swinging from the rafters, and uh, you know Glasgow was was incredible too, and um, yeah, it was it was uh, it really feels great to see the growth of the band. Do you guys? I mean, obviously, it's not your first time going over there. I mean, have you done a decent amount of touring in the UK over the years? Yeah, so our first, I think our first headline tour was in the spring of 2016 there. And <clears throat> other than the London show, like I mentioned, uh, it was pretty, 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 pretty thinly attended, I, I'll say, though very spirited crowds, uh, low in low in number, high in spirit. Um, and then we did done it. We've done a bunch of supporting stuff over there, too. Most recently, I guess, was with Bouncing Souls in 20. 19 right pre-pandemic and then um so this has been our first time over there and it's been the first time i'd say where we can go and basically all the shows were kind of a similar similar attendance vibe and similar amount of sold out shows to what we do in in north america so um Put it this way, it feels nice to actually come home from uh, from the UK with some money. <laughs> <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm if I'm if I'm just gonna call it straight, that's 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 uh, part of it. <laughs> Fair, yeah. I feel like that's a good. That's always a good end to tour. You uh, don't come back in the red. You have a couple right. of dollars in your pocket. Didn't it? Didn't right. cost you money? Exactly. Kind of you, I'm sure you've played a good amount of songs off uh, Free Reign at this point. I mean, any uh, any really, really kind of stick out is just absolute, like, my God, that song translates well live. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're playing a lot, but are there a couple where you're like, damn, that just, that works in a live setting. Yeah, well, I think people people seem to really like Celebration and Nicer Guy. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like we're we're in a fortunate position yet where, or where we haven't, we've put out four studio albums and one um, compilation album of our early seven inches and stuff. And we haven't yet hit the point where, and I'm sure it's coming. It happens. I'm sure to every band, but like we haven't hit the point yet where people are like, ah, yeah, but you got to like the old stuff's better. Like every single time we put out an album, there are the people that are there to hear that album and uh, there's a lot of people that have gotten into the band from the new album. Um, and so I just feel really lucky and fortunate that we're still kind of on that in that in that place of of people being really excited about our new music and not only coming to hear us for older music. Um, so I guess a bit in, in a roundabout way of answering your question, I pretty much everything on the album people were yelling for 
uh, every night. Like, um, you know, we, we celebration, we played every night and nicer guy and the song free reign to passions. People seem to really go off on that one. And, uh, but you know, we, we try to rotate all the songs every night. So we play atomize me or, nice. um, blowing up things in the woods and, um, uh, and the light, the void and everything. And, you know, we, we would kind of, kind of rotate through a bunch of the other songs. But uh, yeah, I, I guess I, I, I just, I feel really lucky and fortunate uh, and accomplished, I would say too, that people still really like what we're currently doing. Can you like, like, as I was like talking about, like, you know, the, like what ones translate well live and like you're saying, like the ones that people react to the best, how much of that can you tell beforehand? Because it's like, can, can you with a song go, well, shit, this is going to work live. This is going to go really well or can you not gauge that are there times you think that and then songs just don't go over well live as much as you think they do i mean can you kind of tell that before playing songs live or do you really not find out what ones translate and what ones are going to get the best reaction until it actually happens basically usually i think a good rule of thumb is if it sounds massive and it's really simple then people are going to like it and the more intricate it is and the harder it is to play usually the less people like it is it, <laughs> kind of uh it's a little bit of a, a trend, but also I, it's hard for me to even say because some songs that are really hard to play, I'm focusing so much on just trying to play it that I don't really have as much attention span for seeing what's happening in front of me. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd say the bigger and dumber, the better it can be. <laughs> that works best. Yeah. This is, this is kind of, as you're saying that, cause I mean, yeah, you you play some insane. I mean, the, the stuff you're playing when you're singing sometimes blows my mind. Does that ever come into play when you're writing set lists? Do you ever try not to like maybe space those out of their songs where you go, God damn, that's a hard one to sing and play at the same time. Let's not put three of those back to back to back. Is that ever a thought or is that not even some kind of thing when you're getting a set list around? Well, I first of all, I appreciate the compliment. I mean, I I, I honestly I don't even I don't even think about playing and singing at the same time. Cause it's just, I think it's just, I've done it for so long and like it, it's, it's really, I would say, I, I mean, there, there's, there's exceptions to that. There's some songs that are like that one is a pain in the ass to pull both parts off at the same time, depending on the night. But um, I'd say we kind of organize our set list more around like trying to, basically come in hard and 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 keep the energy up off the top and really kind of it's really about choosing where we want to step off the gas or pull our foot off the gas for a bit and um and how to put our foot back on the gas uh it's kind of more so around that versus like what's hard to play and what's not hard to play because at this point especially like we had just done like 40 shows in the united states right before that uk tour so like pretty much everything was feeling pretty good by that point i'd say you know how did how did that tour go i was actually very pissed i thought i was seeing you guys in buffalo realized i had to work a baseball game how did no, no worries. Uh, how, how did that how did that tour go it was definitely my favorite a north american tour that we've ever done and we've done a lot of them but that was <laughs> i mean just in terms of I mean, we got to play with Daniel Romano and the outfit. Every, like we we did a co-headlining tour with them. Like that was the that was the our, our our billing partner for the whole thing. And just getting to see them play every night was absolutely incredible. Just fantastic songs, fantastic musicians, and we had a lot of fun together. I mean, the tour was pretty heavy. Like there was some some weeks where it was six shows on, one day off, and that one day off is just like a fourteen hour drive day. So it was definitely very grueling, but um, extremely fulfilling. All the shows were incredible. There's like there was only one or two like kind of low attendance shows. One was New Orleans, and I think that was it. Basically, everything other than that was pretty packed out. Um, you know, we sold out the Bowery Ballroom in New oh, York. Nice. We sold out the Troubadour in L.A. Um, it was, it was, it was. I mean, you can't really, in terms of charting where we started and playing in kind of DIY venues and people's houses and stuff, and 
um, starting to tour basically about 10 years ago, really heavily in the United States and seeing where things are at now. It's, um, it's, uh, it's not lost upon me how lucky we are and, and how far things have come uh, for us. So it, that aspect of it is definitely quite animating and very, um, very sustaining, even when you're, you know, sick and you're tired and, you know, you're in the middle of the mo the more grueling leg of the tour. Like you still walk out and you see all those people and they know all the songs and it's, it's, it's awesome. Like, you know, it's hard to have a bad attitude about that. So, you know, answer your question. Like it was, it was incredible. It was incredible. And to like, to leave, to get out of the pandemic, you know, we, we did some supporting tours uh, at the end of 2021 and we played, you know, a few gigs here and there flying gigs last year, but it was really important to us to like get back on the road and, and really do it in a, in a serious and like high volume way and, and to get to the other side of that. And to, uh, it just feels amazing. feels like um, things are at another level now in terms of our, uh, where, where our, where our fan base is at and, and uh, the response to the shows. And it's just, yeah, as I said, I just, I just, I feel very, very fortunate. Nice. I mean, sound the band's in a good place by the uh, sounds of it, and good uh, reception of new record. Which I mean, let's let's get into that with a uh, free reign to passions. How uh, can you take us back? Like, when did work on this start? In between, you know, fuck art and now. I mean, where where did you start thinking of uh, writing the follow up to that? When did when did you start beginning? You know, to start writing songs for this album. Uh, basically, as soon as we finished fuck art, because you know. There's obviously I can go, we could talk, we could spend an hour plus or the rest, <laughs> the rest of the day talking about all the negative things about the pandemic and especially its effects on the world of rock and roll specifically. But one of the positive things was that it kind of broke us out of the, the, um, the, the, the track and the cycle that we had been on for the last five or so years, which is like, make an album go and tour it forever until you're like you know destroyed and then like and then lose all of your like songwriting chops because you're not really writing because you're just like focusing on playing all these shows and and then have to rebuild the whole thing in a grueling and time-consuming energy draining way um and then make the next one and then go tour it for years and then so the being ba basically long story short like getting done fuck art and having nothing really to do other than some live stream shows and finalizing the artwork and all that stuff i i basically fired up my garage band uh interface that i hadn't used since i was like 16 years old and we were all separated because you know there was so, like it was pretty tight lockdown rules here and uh, so I just started sketching out ideas and I had a really, really great time doing it because instead of trying to make like really nice recordings or something like that, like I would choose like the dumbest, most distorted, like 808, like rhythm composer, like track that is in GarageBand and I would play guitar over it and like sing a distorted microphone over it and make these like super terrible, but funny to me, at least demos of songs and that's kind of how I started sketching together like the first few songs for uh, for the record. And the first one, I guess, was Bye Bye Big Bear. And then the second one was and then I kind of got into Nicer Guy. And then we got done all that touring at the end of 2021. And I got COVID from that. So I was kind of stuck inside. And uh, <clears throat> when I had COVID, I wrote a bunch of songs that made, that ended up on free reign to passions and uh and then i would say like the best the best nil songs are the ones that kyle and i kind of develop organically together like it's not when i write a song and bring it in it's the which you know that those can be great songs too but in my opinion our best songs are the ones where we're kind of reacting to each other in the room and we just kind of like make something um, and I'm biased because I like that better because it's less work. <laughs> it's just kind of like more of like an organic thing that doesn't require a ton of like my time um, <clears throat> working by myself, which most of the other songs do. 
but those kind of like spontaneous things like like celebration was one like i had the riff for a while but i didn't have a song like and so i just kind of started playing it one day again with kyle and he started playing the drums and then you know we basically had a song like after one sitting i just kind of came up with all the words and it was really simple and um you know those are always my my favorite songs to play is the ones that we that we put the least amount of work into because they're usually really simple and fun to play and uh especially when you're playing live those are the funnest ones to play the ones that you don't have to think like where you can really kind of you know you can really engage with what's happening around you and like you know fist bump that guy over there and you know uh go hip check uh, Sam over there and like have some fun with it because you're not completely occupied the whole time. And, and so anyways, yeah, like, uh, you know, I guess in, in summary, like I kind of started writing the songs as soon as we finished fuck art, cause I had nothing better to do also because I had learned from all these other times, like you just have to keep writing. Like you got to keep writing because life's short and I'm going to die. And so you might as well write as many songs as you possibly can. And you don't want to like, I've learned that like when I stop writing songs for like six months and don't come up with anything new, it takes a long time to like, to get my head in that, in that space. And, and to me, writing songs is all just about confidence. It's about making decisions and then moving on to the next decision. And I find for myself that when I take a long time off that process, that I have a hard time making decisions because my confidence isn't where it needs to be to write. If that makes sense. Like um, it's, it's uh, you know, to me, it's, it's an iterative process. It's like, you have a big slab of, of clay and you, you make a mark into it and then you stand back and then you, you go up and you make another mark. And then, you know, you do that a hundred times and you have a song basically. But um if I've taken a lot of time off of it, I tend to over overthink like maybe this mark, maybe I should go back and remove that mark. And, and you know, I, I just kind of I don't move through it with the same kind of stride and confidence that uh, I have when I've been doing it all the time. And so I've kind of learned that I just have to always even if I'm just kind of tinkering away on a song and nobody's ever going to hear it's just for me just to keep that mu those muscles um, in shape. No, it's, it, it seems like one of those things where, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it, it takes a while to build up the stamina, like with songwriting, but like the second you stop, it's hard to get back to where you were. It is. It's hard it is. to build that back up. Kind of, kind of going off that, like with song ideas and just writing, even, even when it's like, you know, maybe it's not the greatest thing you ever wrote, but you know, you just got to keep writing through. Like, do you tend to have, and I'm sure it changes, from, you know, time to time, but like, is there X amount of time you would say you spend on a song before you go, all right, I got to scrap it. This is going nowhere. Or are you more of someone who will kind of keep that stuff in your back pocket and five years later, maybe you pull a riff out of, you know, something that didn't work five years ago and you're working on it. Well, here I have it. I'm going to salvage it later. I mean, in terms of those things, do you kind of hold on to things. Do you throw them away pretty quick when they're not working or do you kind of fall on that spectrum? I think I pretty much hold on to everything as like something that could be like, some, you know, sometimes we've had songs where um, there's I there's parts of it that I like, but the out, the overall song sucks. Like, it's just not it's just not a very it's in the words of Dewey Cox. It's not a very good song. You know, uh, that's that's how I feel sometimes about the songs like. But that doesn't mean that I won't like, OK, let's just let's just put this one on the side here and then I'll cannibalize it years down the line and be like, I still think that riff is dope. So let's bring that back, throw it into a different key and, you know, throw all the other bits out and 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 uh, and uh, start it from the ground up again with a fresh mind um fresh perspective so i'm always doing stuff like that i'm always like we're always recycling ideas if they didn't quite work um and uh there's some songs where you kind of get to the end of it and it's done and then it's it's just not the best song and you're like well there's not really anything worth cannibalizing off of this thing let's just let this thing be um there's some songs like that for sure but usually if there's a song that we're working on and we're working on it for a long time. And even if it doesn't get there, there's a reason why we've been working on it for a long time. 
there's something in there worth keeping. And so sometimes you need some, a little bit of time to pass to, to get, get a, get a healthy perspective on it rather than there's, there's, there seems to be to me like a, a point of diminishing returns when you just keep working on something and you keep trying to just grind it into marmalade you know, you just keep going and going and going like you can you get you get lost in the sauce, you know, and uh, and there's a point at which like working on something will no longer make it better. And uh, I find that especially with like mixing stuff like or hiring visual artists to do our 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 album artwork. Like we try and make the right hiring decision being like, we like what you do. Go do what you do. And we'll give you maybe like you know, five notes for the whole album, but we're not going to micromanage like this should be louder here and that should be louder there. And this should be quiet. Like we don't, we don't, I don't really like engaging in that process because we've, I've learned all these lessons the hard way from like being a young band and trying to micromanage mixers and micromanage visual artists. If you get a piece of visual art back that you hired somebody to do, and there's a lot about it that you want to change. It's probably your fault because you didn't hire the right artist. Like it's, it's, it's not, it's, it's probably smarter to down tools with that person and say, thank you, but we're going to go in a different direction than to try and get into the weeds and being like, well, can we move this over here up this a bit? And can we fix this hue of pink over here? That's, it's just a waste of time. You know, you, you, you gotta just, you got to you got to make the right you got to hire the right people whose work you like and let them do their job and not and not micromanage them. And so, I mean, I, I, I realize I'm kind of segueing into another area here, but oh, this makes sense. I see what you're talking about, though, with this. I mean, I feel like you can even apply that with music. It's like if the majority of a song is good, it's going to be good. Like you, yeah. you bring the bass up in the mix a little more here isn't going to make a shitty song. Not shitty. It just no. won't do it. You know, no. the majority of it is good there. The little nitpicking shouldn't be so necessary because if the if the overall project product is good, you know, again, those those little things you're trying to work on, I don't think you're going to change a huge amount, be it music yeah. or, you know, visual art or whatever, you know. I mean, some of my favorite songs of all time have horrible recordings to them, and it's not the it's it's the song that rocks. And like, if anything, the imperfections of the recording amplify that and that's what i love about it but i don't like any music that sounds perfect none of it um i like i like imperfection and so i think it's very tempting especially in the modern in the modern world when we have so many tools at our disposal to, to smooth out all the imperfections and to obsessively edit and do all this stuff like that is basically like an inner ocd that pretty much every artist has a certain amount of within them and you have to kind of ne negotiate your own relationship with perfectionism. But the older I get and the further we get into this, the mu I'm much more like, well, fuck it. Like, that's the song. What? Let's work on the next song now. I don't like I don't like grinding the songs into the ground. I just don't like doing it because I think I would rather invest that time and energy into making more songs or to, to another project. Um, that's not to say I don't care. I obviously care a lot. I, 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 you know, the, after I get off this interview, the rest of my day is going to be spent working on songs, but it's, uh, but I, I also believe in, in not in, in, in putting a certain amount of stock in like, well, that's the way it went on that day and it rocks and let's roll with it. You know, let's not, let's not try and make it perfect. You know um, it's uh, I feel like recording and like specifically like making songs and then recording them is like working with radioactive material and you've got to limit your exposure to it. That's how I see it. Like, because we've done albums where we spent a year, like forever working on things and then like taking it to this mixer and then like taking it to that mixer. And then, oh, we just need to do some more guitar tracks to like, because these don't sound as good. And like what I've learned from all of that is like get it right in the studio. Just like just get in there, execute it quickly, make decisions and keep moving. And like don't um, time 
time is the most important commodity and don't waste time on on trying to get things perfect because it doesn't fucking matter like what matters is the songs in my opinion um oh, absolutely it's, it's like it doesn't matter the exact perfect like it's nice when things go really well in the studio for sure but even if like the there's a little bit of tinniness in the in the bass or there's a little bit of tinniness or like it's not quite as as defined as you want it to be in the guitar or whatever. It doesn't fucking matter. Like um, you're put it this way. You're never going to be totally 100 percent happy with it. So abandon. I always think when when we go into the store, the recording studio, abandon all hope ye who enter. That's that's how <laughs> I feel. Uh I I I I kind of just visualize a sign like that above the recording studio because <laughs> um, rock and roll is an Im imperfect medium, and that's why we love it, you know. And it, the 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 key is to um, to accept that and to work with that rather than to try and micromanage and manicure every single little aspect of it. Well, kind of kind of with what you're saying too, I feel like it's almost. You know, from an outsider perspective, it's almost like when you like, I don't know, you're like you, you hit your headstock or your guitar on something and there's a little nick on it. And there's a little like you can you can see where you fucked it up. But the thing is, nobody else sees it. Nobody yeah. who looks at that can see it. But you and you're obsessing over it. I feel like the same thing with an album. I don't know personally how you wanted a mix to sound or how a song in your head sounded. So to me, those imperfections don't even exist because exactly. I don't hear another way. You know, I, so it seems like a mental thing in a lot of ways. It is to, to me, it's a very much so it is a mental self-discipline OCD, you know, and, you know, I shouldn't say OCD, but like obsession type thing, like we're all wrapped in and you have to have the self-discipline to not let that devour you basically. Now, if I'm, maybe I'm totally forgetting it wrong. I guess, I guess we did do the interview like two years ago, but is you're talking about kind of streamlining and getting things and not sitting there and trying to like fine tune them. If I'm remembering correctly and stop me if I'm not, but like for fuck art, I think you guys were in the studio, like right as things were shutting down. So it was yeah. a, it, if I remember correctly, I remember talking about like guitars and stuff. It's like, you didn't have time to play with a bunch of stuff, not all this fine tuning. Like, do you feel like you learned some of that from recording fuck art? I mean, was some of that there or was that something you already kind of figured out before recording that? Cause if I remember that correctly, yeah, there wasn't, that was a, that seemed like an experience of you can't sit there and get it fine tuned, touch everything the way you want. You got to get this album done. Yes. Well, I think that I had already had my suspicions about, you know, a utilitarian um, get it done type uh, vibe is probably the best for me but fuck art really reinforced that where it's just like there was no choice as you said of like of kind of like well you know for this song i'm thinking we set up that amp and do this it's just like we didn't it was just like we had to get one setup and just like it, we needed to get it done. we needed we had 24 we had 48 hours to do all the guitars and so we just had to get it done like and so you know, I had like two or three guitars. I probably only used really two of them. And we just we just ripped through the whole thing. And and I was really happy with how it sounded. And that's basically how I feel now about doing things. I mean, there's certain little times like when you have the luxury of an extra couple hours to be like, oh, well, let's try this weird effect on this thing and see how it goes. And if it doesn't sound right, who cares? But yeah, I just I just don't like. I think that. I I like recording, but I also don't like recording. Like <laughs> I like recording I like recording when it's got momentum and you're executing things. Um, but I don't like recording when there's a luxury of time and you got lots of time to second guess decisions and second guess sounds and all that stuff. Like I don't thrive in that kind of environment. I thrive in like an execute it, get it done throw a little pixie dust on top of it and then get the hell out of there. That's that's so fuck art, like by its very like constraints, like forced me to just get it done. And I really liked how it sounded. So um, that's kind of been my personal philosophy on at least the guitar side of things and the vocals too. anything that I have to do. Like I just, 
I, I, I don't let obsession get the best of me. Right? I work, I work again. I, I push back against obsession as much as I can. That's not to say that I'm going to like, you know, mail it in and be like, fuck it. Like whatever. It doesn't matter that it's out of tune. I don't care. Next song. Like, obviously I, I like, you want to get it done and serve the fact that you worked really hard on a song or whatever and, and execute it properly. But I kind of have, I'd say that like, to me, the, the kind of artistry side of what we do is kind of what we do in the practice space and, and privately, like when we're working on things, when I'm writing songs or whatever, like that's kind of like the, the art side of it. And I really much more, more think of the studio as like, as uh, it's much more of like, like a job to do um that has less it's fun and there's definitely some art to it but i have much more of like a uh of like a this is a project that has to get done type type mentality and since you know we basically pay for our our own records and stuff we make them so we we design them to be as like as as profitable as we can make them and so by that by that kind of constraint we like pay for the minimum amount of studio time that we need because we don't want to spend $50,000 making a record if we don't have to. Cause like, why would you do that if you don't have to? Um, yeah. So we're very kind of, we're very, I know I keep using the word utilitarian, but that's, we're very much so, you know, 95% of the work is done before we even show up at the studio. You know, it's 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 demoed. We demoed it with our friends. We we jammed the hell out of it in the basement. Um, and that's not to say that we're not spontaneous in the studio and we'll change an arrangement here and there, depending on how it sounds that day. Be like, that sounds cool. Let's do that. Like, but in general, you know, we don't show up to the studio with ideas and then like see if we can put these ideas together into a so like it's it's we've done the work by the time we show up so that the studio can be this fun execution of all of our hard work. And, you know, uh, more of like a, uh, uh, a harvesting of the fruit that, uh, our labors have, have borne rather than, um, you know, trying to generate something, you know, from scratch, which I is mean, insane. It's insane to me that people ever did that. I know people don't do that as much anymore, but it's insane to me that people like spend a year uh, in the studio with like two, so, like you have like two songs finished. The rest gets written in the studio over like yeah. a year's time and stuff that to yeah. me, that seems insane as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not very cost effective. I would say. <laughs> No, not at all. No. Million, millions of dollars. But that's what I was going to say, too, is by the sounds of it, like what you were talking about is, you know, the dirty nil, you might come in with like, oh, here's this little extra, you know, riff or something I thought of. Maybe we'll throw that in the studio. But it doesn't sound like you went in and it's like, oh, half the songs on Free Reign to Passions were written in the studio. That doesn't sound yeah. like that at all. No, the, the arrangements were pretty airtight by the time we got to to the um to the studio it's more like yeah I, ju I just believe in like i think that like playing songs you know and playing them a few times live and stuff really does make them better and so we try and you know when we have the opportunity to to throw songs into like new songs into the set list to kind of see how they work and be like this bridge sucks we got to do some about this bridge like you know um but um you know, there's no rules or anything like everything's different. Everything's always changing. And, and that's that's what keeps it fun. I think like for us, like, as I said, we obviously take our work and our, our music like really seriously. It's what we do. It's what we de dedicate majority of our time and energy and labors towards. But, you know, we're entering into this cool era of our band now where like it's I just can't ever think of a time other than the very beginning when it was this fun, like where there's not like well the future of the fucking band de depends on this next album like we don't think like that right it's just like let's go have some fun let's make some funny songs and like some serious songs some heavy songs some quieter songs like let's let's enjoy this you know and that's we're in a we're in a very nice state of enjoyment um with our music and um and that i don't believe that 
tension makes good records. I don't believe in any of that bullshit. I think that like when you have when you have good chemistry and people are working together and they're having fun, things are usually better. Like you are it's like it's like think about a fucking football team that hates each other. They're probably not going to play that well together. Like it's camaraderie is a good thing when it comes to group tasks. <laughs> like surprisingly enough, uh that does not, you know, that's music's the same way in my experience like when you go when you're working together well and you're having fun things are good i think like the, the quality improves in what you're doing nice no no i it, it seems that way i don't i don't i don't i guess every i guess there's some albums where it works but overall yeah the contention of like i'm in a studio with a bunch of people you uh despise or kind of not getting along with i i that doesn't seem like a good uh kind of chemistry to have when when writing something kind of you know, I was thinking about this too as you were talking about it, like and and where the band is at. Because right before I was talking to you, I was talking to uh, Craig Northy, and we were talking about odds and everything. And obviously, a band who's been around since like the '80s, and you, after a while, like if a if a define if a defined sound kind of comes into play and things like that. So that's kind of interesting with you because the dirty nil is. I mean, you're not you haven't been around for 30 years, but you also have been around. And you got a couple of records under your belt. For you, like at this point, when you're writing, I mean is there in your head a dirty nil sound or what you think people expect the band to sound like, like, do you feel like you're getting there now with a couple under your belt? Cause obviously first record or two, there's nothing to go by, but as you keep going and that's with any band, I mean, you just, hopefully you're lucky enough to be in a battle in a band that long that happens, but how much, how much do you think of that? You know, like when you're writing this one, how much of the past records do you think of in sound or do you try not thinking about that stuff? Do you try not, kind of going in fresh and not going well hey we got these other records under our belt this is how they sound like you know where are you at because you are kind of in an interesting time of your band for something like that well i would say that like kind of earlier on uh, with our first few records i would think about them in relation to the records that we had done previous Mm -hmm. particularly with master volume i was thinking a lot like how do we do something that's not like the first one and how do we make it sound bigger and fuller and you know, I was really thinking in, in those kinds of terms, but I would say I just don't really think like that anymore. And it's not something that I've kind of consciously moved away from. It's just, I think that we have a, a, a solid amount of like belief in our own motives, which is like, if we like it, uh, we don't really care what anybody else thinks, but we're pretty confident that they will like our fans will like it if we like it. That's, I think we've, we've kind of built up, we, without discussing it with each other, I think we've kind of reached that conclusion mutually where it's like, if we think this fucking rips then, and we're happy with it, then that's all that we really need to have. And that, and, 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 but, you know, as I said, but if I had to place money, I'm going to say our fans will like it too. Um, We've never really tried to do something like um, make our fans happy or something like that, um, because I just feel like our fans are are accepting enough of whatever we feel like doing. And at the end of the day, I sing how I sing. I play guitar how I play guitar. Kyle plays drums how he plays drums. And bass is fucking loud and distorted always. <laughs> so it's like. You know, we've had the privilege of playing with many different, a, a few different people, I should say, and they've all brought kind of special gifts to the band. And those are the things that really kind of change the records, I would say, like basically um, leaning on the gifts of, of, of our bass players and, and, and what they have to offer. Because, you know, as I said, I sing how I sing. I more or less write how I write and I play guitar how I play guitar. And same thing with Kyle on the drums. So Sam is just like an incredibly good singer. And so we can do more complicated, interesting harmonies than we've ever done before. You can also scream like a motherfucker. So um, we've got a lot of a lot of, got a lot of uh, paints on our palette these days, and we're having a lot of fun, kind of experimenting with them. But um, yeah, I'd say like our primary goal at this point is to just like make something that we're excited about that's that's all we really want to do we don't have any we don't have any masters above us being like you got to do this you got to do that we don't have anybody in our ear ever telling us stuff like that we just have ourselves being like yo this song rocks 
this is sick. Like we're still, it still feels like we're 16 years old, you know, like uh, on a good day, I'll, I'll add. <laughs> but uh, you know, when you get, when you, when you come out of the, out of the basement with something that rips that you didn't have when you're going in, it's still like, it fills you with the feeling that anything's possible. You know, it's, it's just the best feeling in the world. Like it's a feeling that like, there's different amazing feelings from playing live and crushing it, but nothing to me beats the feeling of like having a new song in our back pocket that nobody's heard yet. That fucking rips. Nice. No, actually I was going to talk to you. I mean, you mentioned, you mentioned Sam a second ago, which I mean, my God, I mean, this is his first record with the band fucking. Yeah. Did amazing, amazing job on that. How did kind of Sam get in the mix with, uh, with the band? How'd you end up, uh, going with him how how did all of that kind of go i take it i take it you knew him before uh he joined the dirty nil i would i would assume you kind of all knew each other before that yeah so basically he was already on our visa to go to the states and um and we basically said like when raw society want to go back to school we were like that's totally cool like who do you think we should get he's like you should talk to sam and uh and i was like oh yeah shit sam plays bass i forgot and then we were like, hey, man, you're already on our visa. Do you want to come do this tour? Like, we're, you're already coming to do the tour. Do you want to play bass? And he's just like, shit, yeah, sounds good. So um, we did a couple of jams, and he could. He was really good. And we were just like, okay, it's going to be great. Um, and so we didn't work on any new songs for, like, that first tour or so because we were still figuring out, like, you know, the same, like, touring and, you know, let's see how things go with, like, the creative side. But – once we started kind of getting together at the beginning of 2022 working on music yeah it was really fast it was just like you know i had our like we already had a ton of songs so it's just like you know you basically we need to arrange them together but they're already written so you, you just you, you can you just got to find your parts in them and we'll we'll change them around a bit here and there but um you know having him be as good as he was on vocals made me kind of write differently for the last few songs that I brought in. And, um, it, uh, yeah, I'd say it was, uh, it was an absolute blast. I mean, like Sam, he's from the same little town that's, that we are Dundas just down the road. And I didn't know him much growing up because he was like, he's like six and a half years younger than us, which is like a lifetime when you're a teenager. Oh, very much. So, you know, I, I saw him around once in a while, but like, you know, I just, it's like when I was, when I was 17, he was like 10 and a half, you know, it's, it's like, you, it's, it's very different. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I'd seen his band play around and I thought he was really good. I thought he was really talented in his band. Captain Wild Child's amazing. So I was, um, but yeah, so he was living with Kyle at the time and, he was going to come on tour to take photos. He was already on the visa and we were just like, you want to play bass? And he's just like, hell yeah. Ross actually was just like, I think he talked to Sam first. He's like, Hey, I'm going to go back to school, but do you want to do this tour? And, and Sam was just like, okay, let's do it. So that's it was pretty- a very seamless transition. I'd say. I was going to say, what a smooth, you couldn't ask for a smoother transition there. It just seemed to work very well. First guy very you tried, nice. it worked. D- you know, kind of, kind of going off that. Cause like, that is the thing. I mean, anybody listens to a Dirty Nil record, I mean, the bass player, you got you got vocals going behind what you're doing. Like, I mean, there's oh, yeah. very much the ba- the bass player is not just playing bass. And I mean, I know oh. as a fan, I got to give him credit because I mean, even after Ross left, that's a those are big shoes to fill. There's a lot going mm-hmm. on there, and he did a good job. But like for you, when you're writing, how much of that do you hear beforehand? Like, I mean, how much of that comes after you're bashing out the song, or can you hear when you're writing something like? Oh, okay. You know, I have those backing vocals here, or a scream would work here. I mean, is that stuff you're hearing in your head as you're putting those together? Does that come out as you play as a full band, and you know, the bass player, whoever it is, kind of figures that out as you as you're kind of playing along? I mean, how how does that tend to work? It's usually um, like as we're kind of playing together, where like you know, uh, Sam's got really interesting, like I'd say with with Ross, him and I sat down and kind of worked out the harmonies a lot more because he was pretty new to harmony singing. So we just spent a lot of time, him and I kind of worked just two guitars, kind of working it out of like what his parts would be vocally. 
But with Sam, I mean, Sam can throw three different ideas at a vocal, three different vocal harmony ideas, and they're all good. So I just kind of leave that up to him. Or sometimes I'll ask, like, what do you, which one do you like better? And I'll just be like, this one or this one. Like they, you know, it's he's he's very very. We never had somebody in the band that can sing that way. So that's I kind of just let Sam do like whatever he's feeling. Um, there's times where like, especially with like the screams and stuff, I'll write parts where it's just like, okay screams got a hat like we're i need an eagle scream here um but when it comes to harmonies and stuff you know i can sing a bit like like sam and i can both sing pretty high but my voice is like really high so like when we're do when i'll when i'll do demos i used to do demos where i would do the harmonies too and then i realized that nobody could sing those fucking harmonies <laughs> so i just kind of like don't do that anymore i just kind of um and by the way i can barely sing them too so like it's it's uh it's not it's not uh, it's not a knock on anybody else like um they're high harmonies that i always write i always write like the melody is high and then the harmony is like fucking i think sam's one of the first times where we've had harmonies that are under the 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 lead vocal which is like a really cool sound that we've never really had before so that's awesome um but um, he's very good at doing them on the fly. So like usually like with the harmonies these days, like and, and, and mostly for free reign to passions, like we would do, we demo all the instrument stuff. Like the, we'd play right off the floor, live off the floor, guitar, bass, drums. And then we'd go to our friend's house and do the, the vocals in his bedroom. And I would do my, my lead vocal pass and then Sam would just try harmonies on top and we'd kind of talk about, well, let's give this part more of a lift here. You got something for this part, try something there. Um, but uh, yeah, he's really good at doing it on the fly and coming up with the new ideas. So we've been able to be, I mean, that's, that's kind of one of the more creative aspects uh, like create it like we've never had more wiggle room there than we do now like we've got a lot of options vocally which is fun to have nice nice for the recording uh for free reign to passions i mean how how long did that kind of take or was it was it a you know i mean like we're talking fuck art you're like you know it's real quick you get in there you get it done i mean what was this one like was it kind of done all within a couple days in a row is it kind of spaced out a little more how, how do the recording sessions kind of go for this one so we went up to a studio where we like lived at the studio and did it over about like two weeks and I planned it and I did a terrible job of planning it because like there was no days off or anything. And, and like, we all went a little bit insane making this fucking record because like we're in the middle of nowhere and like, there was nothing around. So like, you know, we had a basketball net in the parking lot and that was about it. That was the only kind of source of the only recreational thing to do if you hit a wall with the recording. But, um, you know, as I said, like it was a lot of fun because we had, we had like 14 songs and they were all pretty airtight. There was one or two that like were kind of new songs that like we were just kind of, we had just kind of finalized the arrangement for right before heading in. But most of it was like pretty fucking airtight material. So um, we all knew what we had to do and when we had to do it. So it was just a lot of fun. But yeah, I don't know if I'd go like live at a studio again, personally. It was like I kind of like to drink a cup of coffee in the morning and 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 maybe run a few kilometers and then go record to get my mind like in the right place. But we were, there was definitely some shining vibes towards the end. So, uh, oh, no. It was still really fun. Yeah, it doesn't sound like you were talking about. There's no real escape. Like, there's not a uh, off time wise. It sounded like unless you were playing basketball, it was music, music, music. There wasn't really. There's no escape out, outside of that. It sounds like. Right, and like d different people like different things. Like some people like to just be like completely in absorbed in the project and to not have any distractions outside and i'm the opposite i, I kind of like being like okay well we'll start at 11 and we'll go to like 8 or 9 or 10 or whatever and then everybody gets their morning free to do whatever the hell they want to do go for a bike ride watch tv play whatever whatever it is whatever it is that floats your boat so that you can kind of like reset your mind um and show up uh 
having had a mental break from what we're doing. I mean, that's personally my desired style of, of recording, but other people, as I said, are different. They want to just like, they want to just eat and sleep and breathe that recording while they're doing it. Um, but uh, I'm much more of like, it's kind of like a, it's like a, as I said, like recording for me is like, is much more of like a utilitarian function with elements of like artistry and creative decisions, but mostly like you're there to like, I, I go in and I, I don't, I don't really screw around trying out different guitars and different amps and stuff. I just, I plug my fucking white Les Paul into my Plexi and I crank it to 10 and then I say, okay, are we good to go? Let's do it. Like, you know, so I just, yeah, like I just, I, I don't, um, there's some things that I like messing around with in the studio, but I'm, um, uh, I'm a simple guy when it comes to my rock and roll. I mean, you don't want to, you don't want to overdo it. I I'm, I'm with you in that. I like the, uh, also you're a trio. How much, uh, you know, how much extra layers of things do you want to throw on there to then go play live and not right. be able to, you know, I mean, I'm sure with guitar, I mean, I, I to your credit, I, it seems like you do very little. It's, it's very, even your guitar playing, like, I mean, on the records, there's not a bunch of overdubbing of like, it doesn't sound like there's 50 different guitars on here that you can't replicate live. Like you can replicate what you do on record live. And I, I assume you, I assume that's thought out beforehand too. I mean, it's going back with like, playing and singing at the same time like i mean i'm sure you got to figure out it's like yeah i gotta play this live at some point let's make sure i can actually play what's right. being on record versus actually right. playing live i would say that the the most amount of the effort <clears throat> in our band goes into the arrangement basically of just like you know basically like if i bring a song in or i bring a piece of a song in it's like it's about making it so that in our horrible jam space that's basically like a fucking prison cell if we can make it sound good down there, then it's going to be great when we set up microphones and like record it properly. Like um, I try and I try and not do too much. Like almost never will I do multiple like guitar tracks. Like, I'll, I mean, I will do like a, this one's left and this one's right, but they're doing the same thing. I rarely, rarely do anything that's like, okay, here's a rhythm guitar and here's a lead guitar on top of it. Um, I try and make it so that like when it's time for a lead that I'm either doing a really thick lead that doesn't need a rhythm track behind it or, uh, or just have a, a ripping little lead with just bass and drums or whatever. Like, you know, that's if it works for fucking Van Halen, it can work for us. I don't know. Like, I'm not saying whereas we're obviously not as good as Van Halen. Van Halen is like one of the best bands of all time. But like, I don't think like, I think it's cool to have space also. But yeah, I mean, I just I've, I've always like almost always with the exception of like filling in in a couple of other bands. Like this is the only band I've really only re really ever played in. And like my guitar style has developed to be the only guitar in the band. Like, um, and so when I play leads, a lot of the time I'm like bending octave chords and stuff. Like there's not room for another fucking guitar in it. Um, really? So, um, yeah, I think like it's, as I said, like majority of the work goes into like making the song sound as good as it can in a room that's, about the size of this room here uh, with a square ceiling and um, completely concrete, horrible reflections, blown out PA system. If we can make it sound good there, then we're, we're, we're golden. It's going to sound good anywhere. Yeah. I want to, I, I was going to ask too, with uh, recording this record, I remember on the last one, I believe you were not fond of slide guitar. If I remember correctly, you told me that was quite a pain in the ass. Was there any pain in the ass moments recording on this one was there anything where you're like either fuck this i'm never doing this again or even just be it maybe there was something that you heard in your head you guys just could not for whatever reason get it out on you know record it the way you heard it i mean was there any just real pain in the ass moments on this one because boy do i remember you not being fond of doing slide guitar on the last one yeah i'm i'm a time i might be the worst <laughs> slide guitar player that's ever been born i'm my mom's never played guitar and she could probably play better better than i can slide guitar <laughs> But um, let me think, is there any real pain in the ass moments? Um, there was, 
uh, not really. I mean, like our producer, John was really trying to convince us to like tune the guitars down on one of the songs, uh, atomize me to sing it easier. And I was just like, fuck that dude. Like, I think we tried tuning them down like a full, like, so we're down a half step and we, he made us tune down a step below that. Oh God. So damn. We were, like, a step and a half down. And Sam and I started tracking it and he just came over the intercom. Just like, that sounds fucking terrible. Come back in. <laughs> so I think that was like the it like, and then we just like, we did it how we always do it. And then I yelped out the vocals like I do. And that was it. That's a good producer. At least to just right away go, no, I was wrong. I was wrong. Yep. No, that was my idea. My idea did not work. All right. Yeah. Enough of that. John's a very funny guy. I think that, I think he says, well, that sounds fucking terrible. Come on in the control room. Yeah. <laughs> so. How about a how about guitar rig on this one? I mean, you know, like we talked with fuck art, you know, it was kind of limited. How about uh did you play around a lot with guitars and pedals and amps and stuff on this? Or did you kind of have a rig that kind of you basically had for, you know, most of the record? How how'd that kind of work on this one? Yeah, I basically just did what uh I used like my I, you know, I brought a lot of guitars this time with the intent, full intention of like using them all. But John just kept being like, just play your fucking white Les Paul that you play every day and that works really well. And that you kind of like you, I can play that guitar better than I can play any other guitar. And uh, I'm not saying it's magic or anything, but like I, it, it's really the only guitar I play, like, because I just like it more than the other ones. And so, I can get it to sound better than most other guitars. The other thing too, that like recording always reminds me is that like, you know, you put a guitar in a case for like a year or something and then you like take it out for recording and it's like, it does not work. Like the nuts fucked up, the intonation's screwed. Like it won't stay into like, you know, what you name it, some kind of shit. So like most of those guitars that I brought didn't work well enough for me to use them. And even if they did, I'd probably just still use the, I, I, I pretty much used my white Les Paul, my, my custom, my 75 custom and uh, my 335, my Walnut 335 for almost everything. Like there's some exceptions. Um, I, I, th I used, I have this shy boy uh, Telecaster copy that weighs like two pounds and is probably the nicest sounding guitar that i have it's just an awesome guitar and i use that for anything kind of cleaner sounding um it's a beautiful sounding guitar and it stays in tune amazingly um but uh yeah i was i was trying to use my rickenbacker and it wasn't staying in tune and i i i uh i had some other gibson stuff that just it just wasn't i didn't do the necessary preparation, I guess, to like get it ready for recording. So it didn't end up making it, but um, we didn't really mess around with amps too much. Like I pretty much just use, I have two hundred watt plexis and I have a Marshall eight by 10 cab that's 50 years old. And we basically just use that like for the whole thing. I mean, like for cleaner stuff, we'd use, uh, we used a deluxe reverb and um and uh that's about it man i mean like we used a like i don't think there's ever been a nil record where i didn't use my uh super fuzz on something so i use that you know for for like really heavy parts like really kind of droney heavy parts um and i have a bunch of different rats so we kind of used rats here and there but to be honest with you Mo like 90% of the guitars that I've recorded from master volume till now are just my Les Paul into my Plexi cranked up. That's it. That's the way um, it works. There's like, we, sometimes we'll use an EQ pedal or a simple EQ pedal or like a simple like treble booster or something like actually John made this pedal and I've been using it for the last three records pretty much on everything like this is this is pretty much always on the svp i don't know i don't know what it means but uh it's it's basically just a it's some kind of treble booster but um it works really well with my super distortion pickup i'd say um 
And uh, yeah, I mean, as I said, like, I just kind of get like, I wanted to mess around with more stuff this time, but it just, it, it just, when things work really well, it's hard to move away from them, you know, and, and, and spend an hour tearing this down and setting this up and firing up different compressors for these new mics and this, you know, it just, it becomes like, it's like, but why, but why are we like, cause this, this sound already rocks. Like, um, and also it's kind of like, it's my fingers. You can put me on any guitar pretty much. And it's going to still sound like me more or less, like within a few degrees, you know? So, um, I would just let John kind of mess with the EQ on stuff and let him handle all that. And I just play my, my Les Paul <laughs> basically in my, in my 335 mostly you know i used my dan armstrong a little bit on some things oh nice um and um i did use actually this time there was a couple more guitars uh they had a 50 57 junior there that i used on a, a few songs celebration i used it on and um on like on the i guess the left side and the right sides my white last ball and uh I have a I have a 57 TV junior that uh, I used on a few songs too. God damn, you have some nice guitars, man! I do best, have some nice guitars. Yeah. You do appreciate. I, I do have to tell you, same with that walnut uh, 335. That thing's a fucking beauty. You got it's, you got good taste in guitars, man. Well, thank you. I mean, it's it's funny. It's like sometimes when I get bored, especially on tour, like when I'm in the van, I'm like, I'm going to look at new guitars for myself to buy, like just to fantasize, get lost in that daydream of like, oh, it could be cool. But I have to admit, it's like it's so hard to get excited almost about anything at this point because I'm pretty fucking set. Uh, you build the rig you want. Like that's the yeah. like that's what most musicians to not have that, to not go into a music store and start eyeing everything and going, ooh, like I like, no, you got good shit at home. You got you got what you you got what you need. You it's know? not gonna get much better. Can, I, I really think it can only get worse if I stay if I buy <laughs> shit. So I mean, like the the available avenues for me to fantasize are like different distortions and stuff, but usually I'll get one or I'll try one out and I'll be like, I just like my like my rat's fine, it works great, you know. Um the only thing that I'm really kind of like interested in getting at some point is like some kind of weird bizarro electric 12 string of some kind, just because I think that would be cool to fuck around with in the studio. We've done some kind of like mimicked 12 string stuff where like I'll do a pass like in the kind of cowboy chord position and then we'll capo it at the 12 fret and do it like another track on top of it. So it's kind of like a 12 string, fake 12 string, but I think it'd be cool to have like a burns 12 string or something like that but yeah that's kind of it like i'm pretty gibsoned up i have like six less balls like what where are you gonna go from there yeah you're at the top you're at the top of the mountain nowhere else to nowhere else to go with that you're at the I'm, top I'm of a, your mountain and it's dude it's fucking it's uh it's a great place to be i'm very fortunate to be at the top of gear mountain but uh it's fucking, I do, I do, I have to say I miss fantasizing about the next thing, but um, I try and divert that mental energy into just like writing new songs. <laughs> nice, nice. Well, I mean, Luke, I mean, it's been great talking to you, you know, as we start to kind of close this out, a couple months left in 2023. I mean, what else do you, you got anything else coming up in the world of Dirty Nil or anything else, uh, you know, for the rest of the year you want to tell people about? Yeah, so we've got some headlining shows coming up at the end of this month, September. Um, we've got it's mostly Southern Ontario, but we're doing we're doing Montreal as well. So head to our Instagram to see those dates. Um, there's six shows total; they're all going to be insane. Toronto, I can't wait. We haven't been to Toronto properly in in years, in about four years. So this is going to be a big show for us. Um, we've got a bunch of other kind of little pop up stuff that we're going to do the rest of the year, and we're We've got some other shows that we're planning for the rest of the year. Um, but uh, other than that, my friend, just working on the hits of tomorrow. Nice, nice. I will also say, if you're listening to the radio show in Jamestown, those uh, dates you're talking about in Canada, I mean, as long as you can get into Canada, are only like, I think, two hours. I was looking at them. I mean, Hamilton's only like two hours from Jamestown, actually. So yeah. if you like what you hear, 
you could get on over to Canada and all of those, I think the furthest one is Toronto, about three hours, yeah. three and a half hours from us. So you're not a far drive, actually, if people want to go hit up those uh, shows here in Western New York. Come on, visit us up in Canada here. Come on, come on up, have some Tim Hortons and some riffs. If you also missed the dirty nil because you had to work a baseball game when they fucking played bu- Buffalo in July, go to Canada. There, go that's to Canada. The to you. But uh, yeah, man, I mean, new record is out. Where do we uh, find you online? Where do we find the album? Where where do we send people for everything now? Where should we where should we go for everything? I would say just go straight to our, our Instagram page. Uh, all of the information's there. Uh, we also got a Patreon where we kind of run like breakdowns of all the songs and do like uh, and hangs with our fans and behind the scenes stuff and unreleased tracks and that all that stuff lives there. So highly recommend our Patreon. Um, uh, it's just patreon.com slash the dirty nil. And Instagram slash Instagram.com slash the dirty nil. Just just plug us into the Google. You'll find everything you need. Nice. Yeah. Not the uh, there's only one dirty nil. You'll find them. That's yeah. not one of those on Google. It's not one of those names where you throw it in Google and you can't find the band. You're yeah. uh, you're not you're not X or something like that. It's pretty no. it's pretty easy to find the dirty nil. So one time our friends uh, they changed their band name to uh, to Matters and uh, Rolling Stone called them the most ungoogleable band in the history of rock and roll. <laughs> I think I might agree with uh, I might agree with Rolling Stone there. Yeah. But as we as we close this out, if you're listening to the radio show, actually we'll probably play it. We got three hours. I think we're actually going to spin the whole record front to back on the Hell yeah. radio show. But uh, either either way, podcast or radio show. I am uh, Anthony Merchant. Blast talking again to our returning guest, Luke Bentham. Got a new record out, Free Reign to Passions, out now everywhere. And again, if you're uh, near Canada, we got some September shows. So I'll be right back. We uh, got some more music for you and a whole lot more. You're tuned into the Power Chord Hour. <laughs> 